we interrupt this program for an important news announcement. Well, thanks for letting me interrupt because I have a couple things that I'm excited to share. The first is this. We have a date on the calendar where we're going to get together with those who can, those who are able, those who are comfortable. Um, we're going to uh, gather together outside, so it'll be less intense, uh, at the Springfield campus on Sunday, June 21st. And I know, again, not everyone's able to make it all the way up to the Springfield campus or comfortable doing so yet, but it's a step towards reopening our gatherings that we anticipate doing that uh, sometime in the month of July. And we anticipate to be in phase three of the Springfield's reopening uh, path uh, by that point. So obviously things can change, but as of right now, we're planning an outdoor, um, socially distant gathering uh, that we could either wave at each other, yell at each other from our own family grids or personal grids. Um, we won't have like access to indoors or bathrooms. And so we know that you can only be blessed as long as your bladder can hold. So we're going to keep it short, but, but we're going to have a bring your own chair weekend, uh, June 21st details are coming, but plan if you can for that. Now we'll also have all of our online services available that weekend as we do every weekend. But as we go to the road to the recovery, we're gonna be opening up some creative opportunities to gather uh, and as we, as we begin this process. And so again, more information is coming. I wanted you to know about that. June 21st, Sunday, I'd love to see some of you out there. Uh, also, we have uh, this brand new product on demand on our website. You'll find it this weekend, uh, and, and it's our next class. Some of you have been through our next class or, or what we used to call North Point 101 maybe years ago, you've been a part of it. But now we have it uh, in a really cool format. It's a brand new format where you can uh, absorb this entire class in one setting, or you can do that in chunks of a few minutes out of a time. I think you'll really enjoy it. But basically, this class is for all those who consider North Point home, or all those who are interested in what it would be like to consider North Point home. It talks about our vision and our mission. Why does North Point exist? And so we just got it online for you. We would love for you to go to our website uh, this week. And if you have the opportunity, start that class. It's absolutely free. Uh, you will sign up through the, uh, the platform that's hosting it for us, uh, but you, you don't need any money to do so. It's very uh, low intrusive. Uh, uh, type of level for us to be able to sign up and get going right away. I'm telling you, I hope hundreds and hundreds of you are able to this week take some time and re-engage or absorb for the very first time what is North Point all about. I believe at the end of that time, not only will you understand our vision, I believe God will reveal in your own heart uh, how you can be helpful in helping us live out this mission, this mission and vision across each uh, place where we're fortunate enough to have a campus. So anyway, uh, two great things. Uh, that on-demand class, kind of a master class uh, vibe for you. Uh, check it out. Second thing, if you're able to, if you're comfortable doing so, June 21st, and let's get this party going uh, and, and looking forward to starting the process of reopening. All right, let's go back to our regularly scheduled programming because I know this week, oh man, going to be a great message, I hope. We return you now to your regularly scheduled program. Hey, North Point, great to have you with us today. We've been in this series talking about being people of the way, the kind of people that when we have an encounter with Jesus, there's a, there's a movement that happens inside of us that God allows us to have an impact on others. Whatever your journey is, uh, maybe you've already had an encounter with Jesus. My prayer for you is that God would allow your life to have a, an impact on those around you. If you're here and you've come across this message and, and maybe you wouldn't have had in your past what you would consider an encounter with Jesus, I just gotta tell you, I'm praying that you would find your story in the middle of this story. That is, God shows us how much he loves for us. Sometimes it even surprises us and turns our life upside down when we least expect it. And so wherever you're at in your journey, uh, I'm hopeful that today is gonna be helpful. Well, today we're gonna talk about our, our desire and our ability to grow when God's made an impact in our lives. And, 
And I was thinking of the story, perhaps you've heard of it, of the little boy who, he just loved nature and science. And he was out and, and, and one day he, he saw this caterpillar out in the backyard. And so with the help of his mom, he carefully gathered that little caterpillar and, and put it inside this jar. And then he collected, gathered all the, the supplies for, for this jar, the, the soil and the twigs and some leaves. And, and, and he's watching this caterpillar day after after day and then one day he wakes up and boy is he excited because this caterpillar as he finally notices has all of a sudden uh, wrapped itself and found itself in a cocoon and and so this boy had heard about this day and and he goes to his mom so excited says mom the caterpillar is in the great changing room it's going to become a butterfly it's in the cocoon and, and so the mom says, okay, you got to be very patient. Don't disturb uh, this caterpillar because if you're patient, uh, it's going to come out as a beautiful butterfly. And so this boy, this five-year-old turned in all the patience he can muster as he's watching and waiting for this cocoon to break open. And after what seemed like forever, about seven minutes of, of time, and this little five-year-old decides he's going to help this caterpillar escape the cocoon. So he goes and he grabs a pair of scissors. And as carefully as his little five-year-old fingers can cut, he begins to cut open the cocoon and to free this caterpillar. It's at that time the mom finds uh, what, discovers what happens. And, and she has to explain to the boy uh, what you've done is in trying to free this caterpillar from the cocoon, you've not allowed it to develop the wings. And now this caterpillar will never develop the wings of a butterfly. Because here's what we know about uh, caterpillars inside that cocoon. While they're in the cocoon and they're trapped and they're tight, they begin to uh, develop uh, these, these wings as they start wiggling and flapping. And as they move uh, their, their little insect bodies, there's the chemistry that begins to grow and develop. And it's that fight and that struggle that develops the wings that ends up allowing them to become a beautiful butterfly. And if they don't if they don't develop those wings, they're not able to fly. They're not able to find food. They're not able to protect themselves. And so trying to save this little caterpillar from the struggle of the cocoon is actually the last thing, the worst thing that you can do to the caterpillar. Well, I know you're probably not a five-year-old and your biggest challenge is not trying to have the patience to outlast a cocoon. But I, I think that all of us we know what it's like to have a holding pattern, a cocoon season in our life, a time of struggle, a time of frustration, a time of wrestling, maybe wrestling with God, maybe wrestling with finances, wrestling with health, wrestling with career, wrestling with something. We all know what it's like to wrestle. And if you're like me, sometimes in the season of wrestling in your cocoon season, that's the time where you say, God, can you take the divine scissors and cut away this thing that's trapped me because I need out of here. I need my freedom. But sometimes we forget that it's in that season of wrestling that something develops within us that allows us to be able to have success on the other side of this season. And I got to tell you, all of you have been in a season. Some of you are still right in the middle of a season. Some of you feel like you're coming out of a season. And to be honest, some of you don't even know it, but you're about to head into a season because that's how life works. And I believe that what happens in this season we don't know why cocoon seasons happen. We don't know why uh, we feel tight and we have to, to wrestle and fight. But I do know whether it's a divine reason why things happen, whether it's a natural circumstance of someone else's choice uh, that, that we find ourselves in the season. I do know that what happens in us and through us during the season will help us uh, going forward. So today I want to talk about this idea of transformation, this idea of growth, this idea of struggle. And in my notes, I, I wrote it down this way, uh, that my purpose isn't defined by my success, I have the success I have, as much as it's defined by the struggle I handle. My purpose in life is not defined by the success I have as much as the struggle that I handle. 
My, my, my purpose and your purpose is not only found in our success, it's found in our struggle. It's during those moments of struggle that God does something in you and positions you, even if it surprises you, for what he has for you, your purpose. Now, we've been looking at the life of of Paul, uh, who in scripture uh, has has been this this person who had this calling. And I want to look in scripture at what he would consider his calling. And calling is a a million dollar uh, church word for uh, a purpose for his life, a significance to his days. And and here's what we see in in Acts chapter nine, at Paul's big transformation, his come to Jesus moment. Here's what we see his purpose was. It says, verse 15, that this man, God says, is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings. This was Paul's calling that his job, his purpose, his significance would be found in one day explaining to the kings of the non-Jewish culture who Jesus was. Now, that's a pretty cool calling. That sounds significant. That sounds like you're going to be featured in the the Christian celebrity status, that you'll have a lot of Instagram followers. That sounds like you're going to have a lot of respect, probably sell a lot of books, because God gave him a very specific calling that he'd be a voice to the kings, the kings of those outside of his Jewish culture. But that significance and that purpose wasn't found in elements that we would consider success. It actually was discovered through elements of struggle. And it was those areas of struggle that actually defined his calling. I want to look at one portion of that today in Acts chapter 21. And you'll have at the bottom of your screen here, it says this. Paul is, is, is being encountered uh, in this story by, by a prophet. And, and Luke is writing as he, as he uh, recounts what happens in the book of Acts. And Luke says this, after we had been there, he was a companion of Paul's, after we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and he said, the Holy Spirit says in this way, The Jewish leaders in Jerusalem are going to bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. Now, when Paul heard this, uh, and, and we all heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul, don't go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul said, why are you weeping? You're breaking my heart. I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, a little bit of a bizarre situation. It's never happened to me like this, where a prophet comes up to a group of people, takes off Paul's belt. Side note, I've never had anyone remove my belt like that in the public city. That, that's an odd situation. Can you imagine if you're at the price cutter, someone you don't know walks up and just rips off your belt? That's That's actually rude. And this prophet does that to Paul, rips off his belt with a robe, right? And there's a reason you wear a belt when you're wearing a robe, okay? And then he takes off this, that makes Paul pretty vulnerable. He takes off Paul's belt. He wraps his own hands and says, just as my hands are bound, the owner of this belt is gonna be bound and handed over to the Jewish leaders. And all the people said, no, that's not true. We're going to test that word of God and we find that to be untrue. Please, Paul, do not go there. Check out what they're saying. Paul, don't go down this road because if you go down this road, you're going to struggle. And surely that's not God's will because we know that God's purpose for your life has to be evidenced with success. But the truth is, Paul saw something bigger. He said that his purpose isn't defined by his success, it's defined by his struggle. And he said, bring it on, man. I don't mind being bound. As a matter of fact, I'm willing not to just be bound by by these Jews. I'm willing to die for the name of Jesus Christ. My purpose is to speak the voice of Jesus to the kings. And if that means I have to be bound to do that, I am more bound to the vision and mission of God than I'm bound to the people who think they're keeping me hostage. So here's what I want to do. I want to look at our own lives, our own challenges, and I want to see if we can muster the kind of maturity that we see displayed in Paul's life. The kind of maturity that allowed Paul to survive shipwrecks and being stoned with rocks, um, being whipped, being arrested, being accused, being abused, What would allow someone to suffer and struggle that much? A clear understanding of his purpose. 
And what's interesting is sometimes it's the very struggle that doesn't remind us of our purpose. It's the very struggle that seems to drown us from our purpose. And you might be feeling you're in the middle of struggle right now. And you might be honestly just asking God, why or where are you? I don't understand. Today, my prayer is that in the middle of your struggle, it will remind you, not that God's forsaken you, not that he's forgotten you, but that God has a purpose and that struggle, no matter how it got there, it'll do its work and God's not gonna waste this struggle. So let me talk quickly about three ingredients to navigating our purpose because we all have a purpose. We, we were born, there's two most important days of your life. The first is the day you were born. The second is the day you discover why you were born and that's understanding your purpose. Some of you, You've had that moment where you feel like, man, this is, this is what fuels me. This is why I exist. Some of you are waiting for that. But I'll tell you, there's a few ingredients that you can expect when you have a purpose. The first is this, is darkness. Darkness is an ingredient to navigating your purpose. And when you experience darkness, it produces faith. Darkness produces faith. Which is interesting because naturally darkness um, will threaten your faith. But faith, it says in scripture, is the evidence of things not seen. Now, I don't know if you use one of these. Uh, this is a lot more modern version than something I used when I was a kid. It's, it's a nightlight, right? This is a, a Paw Patrol nightlight. Now, when, when, when I was a kid, I didn't like the dark at all. I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not a fan of the dark because things change in the dark. So at night, when it's time to go to bed, I'm coming up with every excuse, right? Of, oh man, I'm thirsty. And, oh man, my legs are sore. And, oh man, um, I got a question. And, and I come up with all these excuses to escape the dark and go back into a lighted area where my parents are. Or what I'd try and ask them to do is, can you, can you leave the light on in the hallway? If there's light on in the hallway, way, things are a lot less scary. Or uh, this invention, I had not a Paw Patrol one, but I had a nightlight as a kid. And when there was a nightlight, it just changed the game. And that's cool when you're four. It might be cool when you're five or six. But when you're 34, when you're 36 and you need a nightlight, that usually means uh, you're having a hard time grasping and coping with reality, right? Eventually we ought to mature to get to the spot where the darkness doesn't scare us as much anymore. And I gotta tell you, when it comes to our faith, when we're brand new in our faith, I get it. There's gonna be times where you can't see God at work and you're gonna need a nightlight. You're gonna say, okay, I, I need to know that God's around. I need a sign, give me a sign. I need a timely encouragement from somebody. I need some favor financially, whatever it might be. And that's not bad and God's good and God does give those kind of things. But you know what maturity is? Maturity is when you can you can see something in, in, in your future when you have no proof of it in your present, right? When you don't need a spiritual nightlight, when you can say, God, right now, man, it feels dark and the shadows seem scary right now, but I'm gonna trust in the dark what you said in the light and I'm gonna keep going. That's maturity. And if you've got a purpose, I'm telling you, you're going to have to learn how to walk in the dark. That's where development happens. You know, back in the day, you know, if you were to develop a picture, it didn't happen inside of a computer. It happened in a dark, damp environment. They would have what they call the black room, right? And, and then the dark rooms, uh, and then they would take the, the, the film and they would soak it there. And it's in the dark that a picture develops. And I don't think it's that different in our own spiritual lives. Sometimes it's when you're in a dark cocoon wrestling season. God just does something to develop a bright picture of your future. And so don't compound the darkness by allowing doubts, the shadow monsters of doubt, to drown out God's purpose in your life. God's still a good God. God has value for you when other people aren't affirming you. God has those kind of purposes in your life. So we need to understand. Here's what 2 Corinthians says. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. Darkness need not be our enemy. Darkness is an ingredient of navigating our purpose. Second thing is dirt. <laughs> dirt produces growth. 
So we need darkness, it produces faith. Dirt produces growth. Uh, I want us to, to look at this right here. This is a, it's just a package of seeds, right? And, and I bought this at the Walmart and, and I'm, I'm believing that these are gonna grow up to be sugar peas. That's what it says. They're gonna be super sugar snap peas. Now, in order to be able to get this to look like the picture, guess what you're gonna have to do? You have to bury this thing in dirt. Now, can you imagine how traumatic this is for the seed? Because the seed grows up, all it wants to do is look like it's, it's a dream. This is the dream. It's got a dream. It says, man, mom, dad, one day I'm going to be a, sh a super sugar snap. And they're like, sure you will, sweet pea, okay? And, and they're like, no, it's going to happen. And they're saying, okay, I believe it. I believe in you. And, and one day it gets planted in the dirt. And can you imagine the trauma of that seed? It's saying, oh my word, I'm getting suffocated. I'm getting buried here. I'm never going to grow up to be this super the super snap pee that I want to be because now I'm getting, I'm claustrophobic, I'm buried, but I'm telling you, something happens when you realize you're not being buried, you're being planted. And, and, and I, gotta, I, I gotta guess that being buried and being planted feels very similar, but the difference isn't in the intention. And some of you right now, you feel like you're buried, but you're not buried, you're being planted. That God's gonna grow something in you, but you're gonna need some soil, you're gonna need some dirt right? And sometimes they'll say like, like people who work with a lot of plants, a lot of bushes, when something's not growing the way it needs to grow, they'll even bring this manure and pack it with manure, right? Because they believe the nutrients from that will help it to grow better. And some of you are up to your neck in manure, right? You feel like that in life. And you're feeling like, am I buried? No, you're not. It means you got a purpose. You're being developed. You're being formed. You're growing, right? Dirt develops growth. And we all know what it's like to go through uh, dirt. But what we resist sometimes is the very thing that God wants to use to grow, uh, to develop growth in our life. If we look back on our history, some of us have gone through a time when we thought we were buried. We thought we were done for. We thought we were, we had a whole lot of manure going on in our life. But it was in those times that God did something in us. That's why we see in scripture time and again that, that when, we, when we don't give up, that the struggles develop something in us if we realize we're planted, we're not buried. The third ingredient we're going to need is discomfort because discomfort will produce stability in your life. Just as darkness produces faith and dirt produces growth, discomfort, ironically, produces an ability to be stable. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with what a stability ball is, but um, if you're not, um, we, uh, we went and YouTubed uh, you know, a, a model, a fitness model who's using a stability ball. And so as, as, as that, that model demonstrates, um, what's ironic is the word stability ball is deceiving, right? Because if you've ever had a stability ball, it's anything but uh, something that is, uh, would produce stability because it is a very unstable situation, which is the whole point. The stability ball is a very unstable deal that puts you in an awkward position. It is when you're in an awkward position that it forces the muscles around you to, to grow towards, um, uh, towards stability. And, and, and the awkward situation is what develops health. And, and some of you, you know, you would never choose to be in any type of environment where you're not stable. But in life, when we have uh, a lack of stability going on, whether our career, relationships, identity, security, financially, whatever it might be, where you don't feel as stable as you want to, you become positioned. And when you're positioned in an awkward situation, God's able to grow something inside of us to grow stability. Here's what we see in this, that strain produces strength. It's true at any gym. If you walk out of a gym and you didn't have any uncomfortable moments, you probably didn't grow. But it's when you walk out of there and you're hurting in places you didn't know you had places. That's probably a good sign. Or it could be a bad sign that you're doing all the exercises wrong, but it might be a good sign that you're doing them all right because strain produces strength. So what area of your life is under strain right now? Is it possible that God is producing strength? Here's what Paul says when he was in, very, in a very unstable situation. 
It says this. He says, now compelled by the Spirit, he says, I'm going to Jerusalem. Not knowing what will happen to me there, I only know. It's very unstable. I don't know what's going to happen. He says, I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. <laughs> Darkness, <laughs> right? Uh, dirt, uh, discomfort. He says, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task that the Lord has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Paul says, prison, hardship, darkness, discomfort, they all await me. However, the purpose sustains me. Here's the last thing I want us to write down. I'm bound to my purpose, not buried by my problems. I'm bound to my purpose, not buried to my problems. What if the very thing you're begging God to remove from your life is the very thing God is going to use to produce something in your life? What if the, the very darkness that you're so afraid of produces the very faith that's going to get you to your purpose? What if the dirt that seems to be burying you is the kind of nutrients that allows you to grow to a whole different level? What if the discomfort that forces you off of your balance is the very thing that creates the muscles inside of you to be able to grow and have strength in your walk? So last thing I want us to understand as we kind of land the plane is this. This season is not your cemetery. God wants to do something in you to will and to do according to his good purpose within you. God has purpose in you. He has purpose for you. That purpose is going to be an impact on others. As a church, let that be true. As a church, when we don't know when we're going to uh, be back to normal, if that's even a thing, when we don't know what this is going to look like or that's going to look like, let's continue to grab onto our purpose. When, when things around us are a little bit different than we're used to, let's grip a hold of our purpose, right? Let's grab a hold of that thing. Personally, let's be those people. And maybe you're in a spot today and you're way over your head and you thought you were forgotten. I want you to be encouraged today. I want you to be filled with hope that God has not forgotten you. God's wild about you. He's got a purpose for you. And I pray that today in the midst of the struggle, he will, he will show himself to be true in your life. He'll remind you of your purpose, the kind of purpose that you'll be bound to no matter what comes your way. So I want to pray uh, with you and for you that today would be a powerful day uh, for you as God speaks to you. So Father, today we do ask as a church that you would you would allow us to be bound to our purpose, that we'd be a safe place for people to find and follow Jesus. That whether that takes on a different look, it wouldn't take on a different purpose, that we would be bound to that purpose. And God, as individuals, there are people here who they know they have had an encounter with you. But God, they're going through it. I pray you would encourage them today that they have purpose. This season is not their cemetery. That God, you have purpose in the middle, even of pain. And God, I pray for those who are looking for an encounter with you, that they would find you today, that you would reveal who you are to them, that you have a life uh, that, that is going to point towards an eternal impact uh, with them, uh, God, surrendering to you. I pray today would be the day of their surrender. You'd forgive them of sin today. You would set them on a path that's dripping with purpose. God, let us be people on the way, people that are bound to the purpose you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.